Good afternoon, I'm Priyanka Khanna, Fashion Features Director at Vogue India, and welcome to the Vogue India and Natural Diamond Council Diamond Festival. Today, I am thrilled to be hosting a panel on the evolution of gender fluid natural diamond jewelry. Whichever term you use, gender neutral, gender fluid, ungendered, gendered free, the move towards a more inclusive de design ideology in fashion and in jewelry is a welcome one. But for us in India, this is not necessarily a new concept. Jewelry, especially natural diamond jewelry, has long been worn across genders. Historically, the male Indian royals were the ones who were known for their jaw-dropping commissions with the jewellery houses globally. At weddings, even today, it's not uncommon for the groom to be seen wearing lines of natural diamonds or a diamond-studded sarpinch on his safa. Adornment has long been a form of sartorial expression. Globally, this move towards a design that is more inclusive has slowly been making an impact on the red carpet, on magazine covers, as well as in retail stores. Bulgari, Boucheron and Louis Vuitton are just some of the larger brands that strongly promote a design philosophy that doesn't see gender. While the Jonas Brothers, Billy Porter and the late Chadwick Boseman have all turned heads with their styling of natural diamonds on the red carpet. In this panel today, we will touch upon all this and so much more. But first, let me introduce you to our incredible speakers. So my first guest really needs no introduction. He's the international editor at large for Vogue and a prolific author. He's considered world over to be one of the most respected voices on historical fashion, costume and design. He has an impeccable eye and is a repository of knowledge. We're thrilled to have him with us today. Welcome Hamish Bowles. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I'm delighted to be here. We look forward to a great discussion. Also from New York is the lovely Nidhi Sunil, the newest brand ambassador for L'Oreal, an active voice against colorism and gendercide as an advisor for the Invisible Girl Project. Hi Nidhi, so good to see you. Hi Priyanka, thanks for having me. I have to admit a strong personal affinity for Hanut Singh's jewelry. Everything he designs makes it to my last list and I'm not alone. From Meryl Streep to Rihanna, Christian Louboutin to Deepika Padukone, men and women both have all been bedazzled by his pieces. A love for jewellery and natural diamonds is also in his genes. After all, Hanuth hails from the Kapurthala dynasty who were known for their patronage of jewellery houses. Hi Hanuth. Hello and thank you so much. Such a privilege to be on this panel discussion. And finally, we have Cost of Day a marketing executive who has spent a decade in luxury and fashion in India, he is also a well-known TED speaker. His TED talk on fashion as identity has garnered a million views. Kostav, we're so glad to have you with us today. Thank you, Priyanka. What a pleasure it is to be here talking on something so close to my heart and what an honor to be on this incredible panel. Well, let's get started because we have um, lots to discuss. Hamish, I'm going to start with you today. So the idea for jewelry, um, of jewelry for men really isn't new. Uh, can you take us through the historical role jewelry has played in the wardrobes of men? And when did it sort of stop being appropriate for men to wear jewelry? Goodness me. Well, I think we really go back millennia, <laughs> I think, <laughs> from the moment that, that human beings started fashioning metal into adornment, uh, men were certainly the 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 um some of the recipients of of the of the treasures that were that were being wrought so i think you know you look at um uh viking cape clasps and mm. and jewels and they were certainly intended for men and uh you know all through history just as uh just as men's clothing was often uh, a great deal more flamboyant than women's clothing, um, that was reflected in, in the use of jewellery. And I think that as um, certainly in the West, uh, as uh, people started adventuring into new worlds and coming back with stories of uh, a sort of exoticized East and uh, you have James I's courtiers and emissaries, for instance, and merchants um, being completely bedazzled by the Mughal uh, emperors and courts uh, in, in India and bringing back those ideas of extraordinary self-adornment for men. And I think that, um, 
you know, it was it was subdued a little bit more in the 18th century, although certainly not not the fashions. Um, mm -hmm. But um, you know, men were still wearing rings and lockets and love tokens. Uh, and then you know, the Killjoy Victorians <laughs> rather kind of um, suppressed the idea of more flamboyant jewelry for men. But you still had. Um, you still had jewellery that was symbolic of, of love and of mourning, um, mm -hmm. uh, 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 you know, bereavement. Um, and I think even into the 20th century, I mean, you had uh, lapel pins and tie pins and mm -hmm. signet rings and so on. Um, but I think probably it wasn't until the 60s and again, another idea of uh, gender fluidity and... Uh, um, breaking down of barriers that you that you saw men uh, embracing in embracing jewelry in a, in a sort of different and kind of exuberant way and I hope that we're I hope that we're going back to that kind of that kind of mood well what I'd really like I, to see is Mughal jewelry come back of course but. I think we'd all I think we'd all love that so, which is going to take me to Hanout, because, you know, obviously, Hanout, your family has long, uh, you know, historically been patrons of jewels. So when you look back uh, into your own personal history, what are some of the pieces, especially with diamonds, that you uh, remember? And were those, uh, you know, sort of commissioned by the men in your family, but they were, were they also worn by the women? Yes, absolutely. So my great-grandfather was actually one of the first Maharajas who went to Paris and sort of took all his loot and bounty and uh, I think Jacques Cartier had already been to India and then met each other and so he went there with all his stuff and then they started commissioning using all the Indian stones and started making those absolutely incredible jewels and the other Maharaja sort of followed through later and um, it became this huge movement to the 20s and 30s. Um, in fact, I'm wearing uh, this signet ring which Cartier made. It was it's from the last minings of the Golconda mines, and it's, um, it's, it's a beautiful signet ring that they made for my grandfather. Um, yeah, so I've grown up, I'm a, I'm a completely untrained jewelry designer, but having grown up around such magnificent pieces, some sort of ceremonial and some sort of everyday things and, you know, beautiful diamond sweets and bracelets, and you know how they did them, and they did them with such flair and yeah. big bang. So yes. It's, it's been a privilege to grow up with them. They're still continuously worn by everybody and um, enjoyed. So you did see sort of a mix in, you know, sort of both the sexes wearing the jewelry or was it mostly the male? It was, right? Well, you know, no, for, for the men, it was always, you know, it had to be the ceremonial jewelry, so the big bang stuff. And for the women, of course, it was a big bang stuff also, but they, they also did a sort of beautiful, uh, you know, like earrings, necklaces, bracelets, rings, things that you could wear during the day because, you know, people used to really dress up. So there was yeah. pre-lunch, lunch, evenings, cocktails, dancing, etc. I mean, yeah. all sorts of jewelry was made. It was not necessarily just sort of like in your face stuff. But yes, the men wore, the Maharajas had to wear the sort of like the big bang stuff when they were on processions, etc. you know, so to create an impact. But beautiful jewelry was more made for the women of the family as well. You know, sitting here in our homes where we basically, I don't know about the rest of you, but I've barely gotten out of my sweats. Dressing up for cocktails and pre-cocktails sounds like a dream right now. Um, Nidhi, I'm going to ask you, you know, about this sort of rise in gender fluid jewelry, which we believe also, of course, is a byproduct of a larger move towards inclusivity in fashion. Do you agree? And sort of what have you, been your experiences, you know, over the last few years? Because, you know, your sort of career has taken off in a different way. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, this morning, actually, I'm wearing all of this jewelry that happens to be my boyfriend's. It's not mine. And it's really interesting because I asked him to dress me today. Um, of course, this is my shirt, but I said, you can pick whatever jewelry I'm wearing. So this is his uh, off-white bracelet. And then this is his ring. And then he had this made by his jeweler. He said it was a baguette. I think he's much more knowledgeable about jewelry than I am and I don't think he identifies necessarily as gender fluid but he uh, enjoys jewelry and he's very me meticulous about his jewelry 
So for me, I, I enjoy really using fashion and accessories in fashion. And I enjoy watching other people too doing this, using it as a form of self-expression because it's just really who you are. If you go through the trouble of, you know, having your jeweler design this for you, I mean, you design it and then have your jeweler sit with you, collaborate with you, and then have this made for yourself. That's huge. And I'm wearing these sapphire studs also. I don't know if you can see it because I have my... Um, and that's his as well. <laughs> so, well, um, he has incredible taste. <laughs> You're a lucky yeah, he girl. Has really great, <laughs> he has really great taste in jewelry, and I've been I've noticed this about a lot of my male um, friends who, you know, have a disposable income. They want jewelry, and um, they there's something about the aesthetics of uh, wearing. I guess shiny things on your body that has a special appeal to everyone and it's really nice to see my you know my male friends uh, adopt that because I feel like heretofore it was very like a thing that women did that men sort of felt like and men sort of felt like they could they had you know it wasn't really their territory at least when I was growing up um of course my you know my my friends who identify as gay or you know non-binary like they're always experimenting with the way that they express themselves with jewelry but i also see it now with like boys who don't identify necessarily as gender fluid or non-binary they're very much heterosexual they love wearing this as well so it's really it's really great to see you know all of this being used as a form of self-expression and not really to sort of box your identity but you you use it to explore your personhood I guess in a sense I, I think that's great I think it really is an exploration of your personhood and Kosib what do you think for you what's been a moment you know in pop culture or you know in a campaign in fashion that you felt that really signaled this shift um, in recent times you know Priyanka I think fashion's always been an expression of identity and I think the moment that I will cherish for a very, very long time to come actually happened at the end of last year when I picked up an issue of Vogue magazine and I saw a man on the cover for the very first time in its 128 year history. And let me tell you why, because it's a bit serendipitous because of this panel. And it's because I always grew up being bullied as a child, you know, it's just the lay of the land as it is. And I like many other boys my age at that point used to escape into fashion as you know some sort of dream and at that point of time it was the pages of Vogue magazine with its incredible couture its incredible supermodels that showed me that a world of magic was out there somewhere it may have been a world that was forbidden to me shameful even for a man to participate in as my bullies would have say but you know, it was in those pages that I discovered a man's voice, a man's voice as powerful as Seamus Bowles, who is right now with us. And it is through that that I finally discovered my courage and I turned my conformance into something bigger. And I took it to a point in which I could express myself with what I wore, with the jewelry. I'm wearing, uh, like Hamish was talking about, a polky necklace, which was something that... Uh, translates from the time of Wajid Ali Khan, you know, from the 1800s. And this was something that pulled me into a state of courage. And that's something I'm very, very grateful for. So when I picked up that magazine and I saw Harry Styles looking like some kind of delicious, decadent Dorian Gray, postmodern, of course, I was filled with so much joy. And that is the moment I think that changed everything. He was in a dress and these beautiful rings on his hand and the words by Mr. Bowles himself that in no uncertain terms taught us that there is no one way for a man to be today. And I think 10 year old me would have been very, very happy and would have just hugged that issue to my heart. Hey, Mish, did you feel that would be the impact when you were writing the story and when, you know, the team was sort of conceptualizing the cover? Did you, did you, did you realize what, how many people more you would be speaking to? Uh, well, I felt that there would be some impact. I was I was uh, blown away by the by the by the response and um, uh, on you know on several sides of the argument. Of course, it it very much um, energized some um, 
right-wing pundits who felt that it was not appropriate for men to be um, experimenting with their clothing and so on. So um, that, of course, was um, an unexpected but not undelightful reaction. Um, uh, I think, you know, I think what was so what is so wonderful about Harry, and I think he um, articulated it very well to me, was just this idea of, um, you know, if you're looking at men's clothing and then you're also looking at women's clothing and traditional women's adornment, you're <laughs> the playing field is so much bigger. You know, mm -hmm. you have you have yeah. so many more options, and um, yeah. I think you know it was exciting to see you know this kind of cis male guy <laughs> wearing mm -hmm. um you know a, a a a pearl necklace and um a twin set and you know like like some kind of um 1950s <laughs> sort of conservative mom british yeah. mom um <laughs> and just kind of co-op co-opting all these tropes and just showing you that you can have fun with fashion and adornment and there are no categories and everything is and everything is up for grabs and um you know the fact that he looks so um compelling and wonderful uh, in in those adornments i think is uh, a, you know a great a great kind of argument <laughs> so um um i think that's uh, um I, I did not anticipate the the um the feedback that we would get, but it was it was exhilarating when it started when that roller coaster started happening. I, I can imagine. Do you believe, Hamish, then, that uh, we're at the most inclusive moment in fashion history? Uh well I think I think a certain kind of um subset of 60s <laughs> counterculture was probably pretty inclusive um mm -hmm. but i think in a i think on a with a wider platform this is a um this is an extraordinary moment yes i think we haven't mm -hmm. seen anything quite like this certainly for centuries and it's exciting to see you know uh, it's 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 funny because we're at this such a strange time because you know you have uh you know this crisis that's going on but you also have such beauty coming out creatively which i think um i think you know um really you know proves that old um saying that there is a whole creativity in crisis and i think when we look back you know i hope that's what we also see besides the reality of what's going on right now yeah yes so, i i think i think what's been so moving for me about this past um yeah, and I know it's been just so terrible for so many people. Um, but I think I think seeing the creative responses of creative people has really been mm -hmm. a kind of, uh, you know, life affirming and uplifting thing that's happened, you know. Um, I mean, even, you know, you look at the fashion world and, um, you know, designers are not able to to produce and present in the traditional conventional ways but they've just been thinking outside the box and I've just found so many of those solutions have been so um, inspiring and moving really and, and as you say it just shows you that you know creativity is indestructible and um, um, you know that kind of vision is something that is so um, uh, is so enhancing to all our lives you know I truly believe that, uh, you know, beauty is the antidote to hatred, Priyanka. So, you know, the more of it we put out in the world, just like this, it comes back to heal us. And we need a lot of healing, <laughs> I think, uh, at this moment, especially. Um, I know, uh, you know, as a creative, sort of, for you, um, you know, I see a lot of your pieces, whether it's your signet rings or your dagger pendants, which I would see that could really sort of work across, you know, um, all genders, but is there an approach, you know, do your um, male clients who identify as male, do they come to you with certain requirements? Uh, you wear a lot of jewelry yourself, so I just wanted to kind of see how you approach that from a creative standpoint. So not really, I'm a bit snobbish about when I design because I just design and design and design and so um, men sort of like 
want the same sort of things that some of the women want and you know because I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy who designs I don't do sort of frou-frou jewelry it's always sort of streamlined and architectural so men can wear it with ease and more and more and more men are coming to me I do signet rings I do sort of talismanic pieces as you know I riff off ideas of classical Indian jewelry but make them really modern like I work with the with the tiger tooth um, symbol and I do those in diamonds and that's a rage. I mean, like people go gaga over them and I have so many men in, I mean, New York, London, India. I mean, every, people respond to it, you know. Uh, they respond to the more streamlined things that they can wear all the time. I also wear lots of um, sort of astrological stones but done in a chic manner um, around my neck and people sort of really respond to that too and uh, say, oh, could we get an emerald or maybe a little Golconda diamond with something and so I see more and more and more men wearing jewelry and it and it's wonderful oh my god and hip-hop and rappers and all i mean their jewelry sort of like uber in your face sort of blinged out but the young generation today my nephews etc they all sort of love and 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 when they see they, 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 everybody sort of responds to jewelry now you know it's it's wonderful so so yes harry styles was absolutely brilliant that was that was a moment um but you have you You've had sort of men wearing jewelry for a long time. You know, it's just becoming more and more. It's coming to the fore more and more. But it's really there now, if you know what I mean. Kosov, what attracts you when you look for jewelry? What attracts you to? Uh, what are the pieces you wear regularly? Um, I wear jewelry as a celebration. Um, usually for occasions, it's something that's has a little bit of heritage, has a little bit of craftsmanship, has a little bit of India in it. Uh, on a daily basis, what I do wear is a diamond ring. This is the one. I'm not sure if we can see. Uh, it's called a Nelly and it's a South Indian wedding ring worn only by women. And I, I wear it every day to sort of remind me that there are no boxes that we can fit ourselves in. And just looking at it every day just reminds me that if there is something that limits us, it's what we should be pushing against the most because that's when we come out of it. So it's stuff that I pick from the women's world. It's stuff from I, I pick from the men's world. I don't really look at jewelry with gender. If it's beautiful, I want to wear it. In fact, I was inspired by my mother. You know, I fell in love with jewelry, uh, watching her wear it as a child. And secretly, I, was, I, I grew up hoping to be one day as beautiful as her. So uh, it's just, it's just, it's, it's, it, I, I wear it out of love. I have no other reason. I love that. I love that. I think may may I interject? Hamish, hey, yes, I please. actually wore a ring today in honor of speaking with you. And I know that you love the color lavender. And I'm wearing a lavender spinel that um, James de Givenchy made for me. And I said, oh, it's a perfect time as an homage to you. <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm always very excited to discover, you know, um, mauve sapphires or <laughs> anything in that <laughs> lavender <laughs> lilac zone is, is, is a great thrill. <laughs> um, Nidhi, I, I want to talk about you. You know, Kostov says sort of he doesn't see jewelry with the gender. Do you feel that's your approach to clothing too? Um, you know, you know, you, of course you talk about borrowing from your boyfriend and, you know, but what about you and how you sort of approach your style? Honestly, I think um, I'd have to agree with everything that Kostov has said in the sense of I, I see a thing and I, um, I, I, I have a felt sense about it. I feel it out. Um, there's a sort of um, resonance that um, either it's clothes or jewelry or shoes or whatever um, it has to have a sort of resonance with me when I put it on my body um, there's this felt sense of um, happiness or joy or you know a lightness that I that I get from things that have an affinity towards me that's natural and that's really what I gravitate towards so there's no boxes here there's no there's no brands. That's my approach to everything. I feel like that's my approach to a, that's that's the approach a lot of people in my generation have towards everything. You, it's just um. I want to say it's a sense of curiosity. It's a curiosity. So I think you know a lot of what all of you are saying is that it's not about sort of playing it safe. And so Himish, I want to ask you because you know when I was reading up, I there was there it has been some criticism that for especially. 
um, for the more mainstream houses, um, the current crop of gender, sort of gender neutral jewelry is safe. You know, um, do you see, what would you like to see in the space? What would you like to see sort of coming back? I know you mentioned, you alluded to the whole Mughal um, style of jewelry, but what else would you like to see coming? Um, well, I think that, you know, I think jewelry is so personal. I think that, um, on, on, on so many levels, I mean, it can be an, an inherited piece that has some uh, uh, history built into it, you know, um, some wonderful kind of antique piece that um, has an imagined history built into it. Um, I think I'm all for flamboyance, I must say, sober as I'm looking today. <laughs> I certainly had a kind of club kid moment in the in the 80s as a fashion student mm -hmm. at St Martin's where there was a there was a lot of adornment and um there were great kind of um jewelry designers like uh costume jewelry like Tom Bins and um Judy Blame who were who were making um jewelry out of found objects you know it was very kind mm -hmm. of sustainable make do and mend and um created such sort of extraordinary things and I know that you know someone like um, Kim Jones uh, was very close to Judy Blame and actually did some collaborations with him um, so I, I, I think um, and I you know I, I, I as Hanuta said um, it's very important to acknowledge the uh, the powerful impact that kind of black American culture, uh, and the, particularly yeah. in the music industry and rappers and um, that whole world that kind of emerged in the 80s. And that sort of embrace of incredibly flamboyant statement jewelry that then, mm -hmm. you know, got taken up by Karl Lagerfeld was putting it on the Chanel mm -hmm. runway. And, you know, mm -hmm. that had tremendous impact. And I think that that, you know, broke down so many barriers about what, you know, very very cis gen, cis gender um, guys could be could could, could consider uh, acceptable and the flamboyant stake. So I think I yes. think I think a lot of those barriers have already been broken down by that community um, who really led the way. <clears throat> and um, so yeah, I mean I, I I like to see the whole the whole spectrum. I think I think very intimate kind of I mean I, I personally I would love a charm bracelet you know mm -hmm. I love a, a, a I love the idea of of charms each all meaning different things you know um and taking you back to a place I had I, I had a um um I, I had a, a burglary a, a couple of years ago and all, all the cufflinks oh. that I'd collected since since I was oh, no. 14 or 15 <clears throat> except the pair that I was wearing, which happened to be my favorite pair, um, were, were gone. So I've also, I'm also trying not to be too sentimental about jewelry and um, realize that this kind of <laughs> gives me a, a clean slate to start acquiring things again. But I, you know, what I, what I loved about jewelry for myself was the idea that everything had some resonance. Like, you know, I, I found it in um, um, a, a indigenous Peruvian market in Cusco, for instance, or, you know, everything spoke to me of travels or um, friendship, um, you know, love, family. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's something that's so potent and powerful about the idea of jewelry, all these kind of stories and resonances that are, that are built into it. Um, so I, 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 I would love to see little personal uh, you know, trinket objects, and I'd also love to see some real, you know, the Maharaja piece. bling. The big piece. Particularly in my in my new jewelry wardrobe. Let's see. Um, I know when you when you look at the, you know, when you look back, what are the stories that excite? What are the stories that sort of inspire you? I mean, I've been obsessed with gems and jewels and stones and settings since I was like about two, three, four, five years old. Um, and as I said, I was completely untrained. So for me, the training was to see like how the clasps were made. When I started, I started doing jewelry when I was 30 years old. I didn't do it before that. Uh, and so I came completely untrained. And so I started with the simplest shapes, but because I'd grown up around all this 
amazing, the great, great, great masters. And I do believe the 1910s, 20s and 30s was the golden age of jewelry. So to grow up around that in, and see it like, you know, my mom wearing something, my grandmother, my sister, my, my uncle, or, you know, um, just to see the color combinations, the way things were set, the finesse of it all was such an education for me that um, I think it was the best education possible because to live amongst it, to see it, to see the color combination, even clasps, you know, there's always a, it's a bit difficult with clasps, especially if it's not perfectly done. Um, yeah. Being able to play with natural pearls. I mean, there's a difference between natural pearls and sort of cultured Japanese pearls or, or river water pearls. Um, to see sort of sugarloaf uh, cuts and cabochons and I feel very privileged and um, I hope it's informed my jewelry like, like I, what I like to say is my jewelry is like a, a cocktail of ideas some things from the past but very much of the present and um, and the fact that people all over the world respond to it is great so um, I think um... I think, again, you know, what all of you sort of are saying um, is just the personal attachment and the personal approach, whether it's Gosliv's mom or Nidhi's boyfriend or Hanout's, you know, or um, for you, uh, Hanout, your family, for Hamish, it was, you know, totems of travel and experiences and relationships. So I think, you know, ultimately, that's what it kind of boils down to is that you're wearing a piece of your sort of individual identity and your individual um, stories um, on you and I think you know um, that really is the power of jewelry and, and it's emotional just, you know, and it's personal and when people want to buy jewelry they sort of it's their money that they're investing in something that they're obsessed with that they love they're going to travel they're going to travel to see something they're obsessed by um, I don't know it's, it's I see with women with men with everybody who buy my jewelry it's it's it's, it's emotional and it's a, it's personal and that's why it makes it even that much more important and so Hamish when I heard that you, you, I mean, you were robbed and your jewelry was all gone. It's heartbreaking, you know, yeah. because it's a, it is an emotional thing. It brings back memories and I don't know. I mean, I have to, dis I have to disagree though. Hamish almost sounded unburdened when he said he lost all his jewelry. Like he could start all over again and redefine who he was. It's like, oh my God, somebody finally did this for me. <laughs> You know, I can't wait to see Hamish in something incredibly blinged out. I, I would love to see Maharaja bowls. <laughs> but what is, what, what is wonderful is, is seeing, um, you know, uh, like you, you were talking about Karl Lagerfeld, etc. I mean, the jewellery he wore and what he collected from Belle Perron, etc. Mark Jacobs, and I've seen him wearing these Grima pieces in diamonds and gold. And I mean, that sort of resurgence is coming back. People are looking at, at the past collecting it. Um, there's this man called Frank Everett who works in New York and wears the most beautiful jewelry. It's, you know, so I, the, the past does really inform the present. And, 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 and the fact that it's all, uh, to see men wearing all those beautiful brooches and, and sort of pendants and lockets and rings and sort of that heightened taste is so educational, especially for a jewelry designer. And then I saw, I'm sure it sort of percolates in one's design and it percolates amongst one's clients and you know the awareness grows and the awareness grows and the awareness grows i think it's i, I think it's also you know jewelry is also such a sort of wonderful personal signifier i mean i think of jean baptiste valley and that wonderful pearl necklace which i pearls, believe yeah. is one of the strings from the baroda pearls um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know that to me is so much part of his identity and you know his whole self presentation um i always thought that was that was kind of a, a a wonderful sort of sartorial embellishment um very very personal signature of his so i i think i think jewelry can also really help you define who you are and in in subtle or overt ways well, I think, you know, we've had this incredible discussion and, you know, thank you all for sort of being a part of this panel. Um, I think we've had some really interesting stories and points of view. And Hamish, I hope your collection grows stronger and uh, you're allowed to sort of travel across the world and find new pieces soon. Um, but thank you so much. Um, is there anything any of you want to add or, you know, is everyone good? I just think, Priyanka, that this is such an important conversation to be having. And it's such a wonderful 
message to send out into the world and I've always believed that fashion is an expression of who we are and if it is our armor then I believe that jewelry is what protects the soul you know and we should wear it with love we should wear it with impunity and we should wear it as much as we can you know to draw every eye to ourselves in the room to show that there are differences in the world and that is something that I'm so grateful for for having this conversation with this incredible panel thank you Thank you all. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.